And uh, with this, we move on to the panel discussion. Requesting our panel members to kindly join us on the stage as I introduce them. Uh, the next panel will be on data center strategy and the changing role of the CIO. Our panel members are Mr. Robin Roy, Head Product and Engineering, Delta Electronics India. Mr. Anand Tomar, CIO, McDonald's India. Dr. Keur Jathal, Director, Ishan Technologies. Mr. Debashish Banerjee, Senior Director, Sales and Services, Eaton Power Quality Private Limited. Mr. Pushka Rege, Global CIO, UPL. Mr. Gitesh Mahajan, Business Head, Data Center Services, SIFI Technologies Limited. Mr. Amit Mahajan, CTO, CDSL. Mr. Hemal Patel, Head IT Data Center, Aditya Birla Group. Mr. Sangata Dasu, Group CDIO, Kalpaturu Group. And the session will be moderated by Mr. Rahul Sharma, CIO, Tata Projects. Good afternoon, everybody. I think uh, we are between you and lunch. Sorry, we are running late, uh, but we'll try and you know, cover that up very, very quickly. Uh, we are hoping to have quick insights as we talk with the thought leaders uh, in a few moments. Uh, so please stay tuned and uh, please be around. Uh, it is important to hear the views of thought leaders of what they think about the topic which we have selected today on the strategy and the changing role of uh, CIO and CTO and CDIO. Different names are being done. So thank you, everybody. Large panel, but it's very important that uh, when we talk about strategy, we have uh, the leaders across industries who have been, you know, uh, in their own uh, world, they've been trying to make something very different than uh, what we all should learn from. So let me start quickly on this, uh, rather than, you know, uh, talking about introducing everybody and uh, starting. Let me start with you, uh, Hamel. Uh, how, according to you, will Data Center of 2025 and beyond look like? Yeah, thank you. Uh, am I audible? Yes, yes, you are. Yeah. So uh, we all aware that we are in, in modern cloud journey. And I think this question is very much important for all the IT leaders. Let me, uh, let me share you... Uh, 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 in last week, the Economic Times has shared the news that the data center is the highest investment sector across the India. And by 2025, uh, the 25,000th of the RECs will, will get introduced uh, in, in Mumbai, and 45,000 of the RECs capacity will introduce across the India. And same has been also uh, replicated uh, in Prashant's uh, the session in SIFI and the control is as well. So day by day, the data center is rapidly in, uh, the involving and with advent of the technology, the reshaping of the, the infrastructure is also required. So why reshaping? I'll give you example, the decade ago, um, the one single rack used to uh, spare a capacity of six to seven kVA power uh, with fully populated of the devices. But now the single HCI or SDI type of devices itself takes the four to five times of the power. So uh, uh, I feel the sustainability will play a key role in next generation data center. Uh, in, in our digital journey, the data is generating the day by day in huge volume. And business need is also the agility in velocity in each and every steps while it is in real time processing of the data and to accessing of this data. Hence, I could see the, the transformation from the centralized to the restructure of the infrastructure by the acquiring the age, age data centers. And uh, security will remain the top priority, I feel, uh, because uh, the shifting towards the zero trust architecture as well. So based on my opinion, the data center 2025 looks like the diverse, sustainable, uh, resilient, and age focused. Thank you, thank you, Himal. Uh, let me ask the same question to Gitesh as well. You know, how do you think uh, the center of 2025 and beyond look like? Yeah. <clears throat> Hello. Yeah. So uh, taking cue from what Himal has said, right? Uh, from a service provider point of view. Uh, what enterprises and uh, hyperscale customers are looking at is there are four parameters as the data center is evolving. One is uh, scalability. <coughs> Second is uh, flexibility. Third is sustainability, obviously, because 
scalability of power is increasing day by day. And then uh, last is interconnectivity. So going into each of the specific, I'll just touch upon that. Uh, there was a time uh, where, as Hemal mentioned, that six, seven kilowatt per rack uh, kind of setup used to be a normal setup. But now it has gone to 12 kilowatt, 15 kilowatt, and now people are talking about 150 kilowatt to 200 kilowatt in a single rack with the AI coming in. What it means that today more digitization requires uh, continuous scaling and within the same campus. So the campuses of data centers are now becoming a mega campuses rather than having a standalone building. So that's the first change that you would, you know, that everyone will have to adopt, uh, you know, when we talk about futuristic data center. Second is flexibility in design, because we are talking about multiple uh, scenarios uh, in terms of uh, cooling technologies being adopted by various workloads. That requires flexible uh, design approach uh, to your electrical, mechanical, and cooling systems. So that's the second thing that is, will be more important in the entire data center uh, <coughs> modeling going, going forward. Sustainability is given. We all know about sustainability. Things have moved beyond PUE, WE, and uh, carbon neutral. Now we have to focus on how do we do sustainable building design and sustainable data center operations. And obviously, AI is helping uh, you know, in, in great way uh, uh, achieving those objectives. And last but not the least, uh, as edge computing is coming, uh, now data centers will not be in the central place, you know, large data centers. I mean, those will be there, but it will be distributed near the actual end user. So you'll have multiple edge sites. And the most important aspect would be how all of these sites are well interconnected and communicating with each other. So there are the four parameters I think will be very, very important uh, 2025 and beyond when we talk about data center land landscape. Thank you, Gitesh. Uh, this is very insightful. I think, you know, based on what they are talking about, resiliency, scalability, may, let me start with uh, Amit, you know, since you're sitting next to me. What, according to you, can be the best strategies for data recovery and business continuity for data centers specifically? So um, coming from a MII space, uh, resiliency from uh, the data center point of view uh, is one of the most critical aspects for us. Uh, let's say for, a, for any given organization, uh, you have the PR and a DR uh, strategy in place. But um, we in the MII space, stock exchanges, uh, depositories, et cetera, we have kind of moved beyond that. Now for us, it's the zero data loss is one of the uh, biggest uh, uh, criteria. So there we have now moved to a three data center strategy. So you have a near DR site where you are replicating in, uh, in uh, sync uh, mechanism so that uh, there is, you are ensuring a zero data loss. So that, that's what uh, is one of the biggest uh, things that we have uh, implemented. Uh, and none of the strategies uh, for uh, you know, shifting to DR will, uh, will work if you are not doing DR drills. So that is the most critical thing which, which you have to incorporate in your uh, BCP plans. We at uh, MIIs have done this on a live market day, uh, which was a month back, when we shifted, all the MIIs shifted to their DR sites within 45 minutes, and this was not a drill, this was done on a live market day. So this does not happen overnight, this has to be done in multiple uh, drills. So keep these two things in uh, mind. And uh, another thing that we have done, we kind of believe in giving everybody uh, business. So given that we are in a data center uh, uh, conference, uh, so uh, for us, what we have done is we have ensured that all the three sites uh, are with separate data center providers. So this is something that we have, uh, we had a bad experience with one of the large data center providers who went out of business. So to de-risk ourselves, this is something we have done. So these are some of the things which, uh, which is our experience, and uh, I think it will be useful for everyone. Thank you, Amit. Thank you. So let me ask, since you are sitting next to him only, uh, let me ask you, you know, the same question uh, <clears throat> once again in terms of, uh, yeah, 
to you as well, Rakhir. Uh, <coughs> same questions again, you know, what do you think uh, are the disaster recovery and uh, related concepts uh, for data centers? Right, so disaster recovery is actually a huge subject and it is often underplayed because it is only after the production site rollout that one has an afterthought that, okay, let's go for a disaster recovery solution. Now, apart from uh, whatever uh, the gentleman on the left-hand side already mentioned, what is important is to understand the objective. What is the objective of the DR? Obviously, it is for data protection. But at times, if you are into an industry which is high on regulation, then you also want to tick that checkbox saying that, okay, I'm compliant on the DR aspect. Once your objective is clear, then most of us have heard about RPO, RTO. We have calculated that for our IT setup. And that will dictate the design of the DR solution. Now, whether it is on-prem or whether it is whether you are looking at a cloud service provider, uh, the RPO, RTO will, will be of immense consequence. And after which will come your application load which are the applications for which you are designing the, D, designing the DR, that is, right? So once you have clarified objectives, once you have a broad understanding of the RPO, RTO, and uh, a fair idea about which are the applications for which you are designing the DR, then you are pretty safe in terms of your uh, DR journey. And at the end of it all, as was already mentioned, the DR drill, you know, and looking at the backup solutions which are available currently. Now, when we talk to our customers, we talk about D to D to T, which is this to this to then, then tape, because that uh, enables a faster disaster recovery. So these are certain pointers towards a good disaster recovery approach. Thank you, thank you, Kyur. This is very insightful. So with that in mind, you know, we talked about resiliency, we talked about uh, disaster recovery, business continuity. Let me start with uh, you know, Pushkar, my friend. Uh, uh, what is the CIO at leader roadmap for uh, cost-effective IT operations, considering data centers, cloud, all things is coming together? What is your view around that? See, uh, representing uh, IT for a global company in the top five, and. I remember going back in time, in 2002, we, we partnered with SIFI, and we were one of the first data. I don't know if you have that in your CRM, Jitesh, but <laughs> we've been one of the first customers to you. And uh, the robustness of a data center speaks for itself. But our biggest strategy, and that will apply to most uh, leadership, which is now going global, uh, is to complement the business strategy. And being in the food security industry, the roadmap will follow what, see, Competing in India is one ball game, but competing in the world, that's exactly what we do. It's a completely different game. And agility becomes the driving force. So, so it's, it's getting all those four parameters that Jitesh talked about, but also making sure the cost element is there, because we were talking about it offline. The only place where we are forced to reduce is infra. And the innovation is happening, but I don't know if it's happening at the same time. So, so the roadmap is following the road to success, where the business grows, we grow. And Edge is going to be very exciting too. So we will be following it. We have rapid followers to technologies, look at it around the world. We have data centers not only in India, but in, in Europe, given that we are in 138 countries and factories around the world. But predominantly follow the, the way technology on one side moves and the business takes you. That's the, that's the strategy. Thank you, thank you, Pushkar. Let me ask the same question to Sogata as well. You know, what is your view around uh, similar thoughts or the roadmap for cost-effective IT operations? So good afternoon. I think I'll pick up from where Pushkar said. I think cost necessarily is not the parameter when you look at uh, IT. I think that's the first part. You know, I, Pushkar mentioned IT complements business. So it is important as leaders that we represent the value of IT correctly to the business, which is not just driven by cost. Agility, scalability, innovation, these are much more important variables today which the business leaders look at. So in, in, in all honesty, it's probably maybe two and a half years later that I'm looking at data center in a way today, because for me, data center is given. It is there for me, I can tell my business that Anything which you want to invest in, I can start it for you tomorrow because I have a setup which can scale up, scale down, you know, whether, whether I need to 
uh, provide 24 by 7 operations, whether I need to have some kind of security installed. It can be done immediately. So what, what we look at today is an infrastructure and a network backbone which is very, very robust, very, very strong, and an application landscape which is, what will I say, is uh, very, very pointed in terms of the value it is delivering to business. I think if you look at businesses today, it is very difficult to have one solution which can cater to all the business challenges. So more and more, we are now going to very, very specific, pointed solutions which will make you competitive in the industry. It is important to be able to deploy these solutions quickly, securely, and make it available to the customer. That automatically cuts down the cost. That makes IT cost effective. So I look at IT in a different perspective that way. No, that's, that's a very, very well said. I think IT should not be looked at as cost uh, only. Having that same thought on, around cost, uh, you know, uh, Anand, you know, another question for you. How, are, how we should move from traditional data centers to cost-effective data centers? Now, when I say cost-effective, may not be you know, looking at the complete cost, uh, value-oriented, I would say. So, hi, good afternoon, all. Um, so, uh, of course, I believe you know, that everybody is already on the journey of moving into a cost-effective data center, but when we talk about the value proposition around it, you know, as uh, you know, uh, the talk earlier was about, you know, it should not be looked only from a cost perspective. Ultimately, we have to look at the value that it is basically going to bring to the customer. So, for example, for us, you know, uh, we basically were a you know client-server-based architecture earlier. We moved into microservices-based architecture. That data center was able to cater to that level. But you know, we realized that you know that now we basically are in a you know era of AI and edge computing. This is where we are supposed to be moving into. Okay, if the existing data center is ready, yes, we basically will be moving there. If not, you know, we have to identify a cost effective data center in that terms and move there. And that is how the journey, you know, is always uh, innovation uh, from both the sides, uh, both from the, you know, service provider as well as from the customer's perspective, where we have to keep on kind of, you know, complementing each other in order to embark on the journey. Yeah. Okay. Let me ask the same question to Dave as well. Dave, what do you think uh, of uh, <coughs> what Anand mentioned? See, uh, the data center landscape itself is changing. So whether we have core size, we have edge. So now, uh, from a cost perspective, really, one is uh, we have all seen that traditionally we always, uh, not leaning, but from a procurement standpoint, we look at the L1. Today we heard one of our uh, speakers say that how do you really transition them, uh, transition the decision making to the cost of ownership, whether you really look at efficiency, footprint, real estate, all of that. So that's one aspect. But the other aspect is also, we just heard that, you know, uh, as and when we are moving to edge sites, how do we connect your edge sites with your core and how do they interoperate or uh, the softwares and systems talk to each other? So I think adoption of some of these uh, softwares uh, to uh, you know, enable your edge with your core data centers, things like DCIM or asset performance management. We have a use case where you know, for a large uh, hyperscaler or a large data center, you have 100,000 racks. So typically you are managing currently on an Excel sheet, so whether it's inventory or some uh, softwares, but tomorrow, there are, today there are tools available like asset uh, management tools which allow you to seamlessly track and navigate inventory and uh, so my uh, take would be one definitely look at cost of ownership adoption of uh, softwares like epms for monitoring your electrical power management so, uh, devices and how do you really ensure that you optimize uh, the performance. So operating at the right workload uh, work is at the optimum levels to get the maximum efficiency and reduce the loss. So you have to adopt uh, softwares to enable your, um, reduce your losses and interoperate from edge to the main centers and make it more efficient. So it's a combination that I don't think there's one straight answer, but yeah, it's uh, based on how it uh, you know, evolves. Thank you, thank you. Let me ask Robin, you know. Uh, <clears throat> Robin, what, is, what are your views on green and sustainable data centers? Okay. One thing we've all understood is that uh, we need to build robust, cost-effective, energy-efficient data centers, and future-ready data centers. Uh, I'm from a different field, as my colleague said. In Delta, 
we build the passive power in the cooling infra for the data center. Uh, we have taken some uh, decisions as equipment manufacturers that these equipments need to be smart. Now, to make smart devices, it doesn't take much, actually. Uh, for example, every uh, power conversion or power quality equipment would have controls. So what we have gone about is build up redundancies there. Like, instead of replicating the bodies, just replicate the brains. So our, most of our power conversion devices have two controllers or redundant controllers. Even the nervous systems, what is controlling the whole system, can be just replicated, made redundant, so that you get a very robust uh, power solution. Uh, the second thing that we said, we discussed in the morning is predictive failures. Today, uh, you know, the power solutions that we give, we are able to give predictive failures. You know, power conversion devices has been force-cooled. So, to give you an example, a fan is an electromechanical device with some limited hours of operation. So do we wait for that fan to, its bearing to wear out and then go into a breakdown? Or are we able to do some uh, predictive failures? So today, AI, IoT is getting deployed in power solutions where we can actually run algorithms. We can see how much of power that fan is consuming and know that it's jamming up or its be bearing is bearing out. The IGBT devices that are used for power conversion, they also age over a period of time. So there are algorithms which monitor what is the on-state resistance of the device, how much of heat it is generating, what is the junction temperature, things like these. And we are able to do the predictive failure. So the next preventive maintenance, you avoid such failures. So the devices are becoming smarter by the day. Uh, we are also trying to you know, integrate a lot of things which was outside of the UPS systems to be taken care of by the UPS systems. For example, the environment they operate in, the temperature, humidity, monitoring, that can all be taken in by these power systems and can be communicated remotely, uh, well alarmed, enunciated well in time so that you don't face any critical failures. Uh, over and above that, today, these devices are intelligent enough to have a lot of data collected to use the usage pattern. So we are able to you know, communicate to the facility managers how the failures have been happening, for how long they've been happening. And that also helps you to optimize your operations in majorly. Uh, coming to the other part, energy efficiency. It's been talked about for a long time. We know everybody is trying to, my colleague said, we are coming out with 98% efficient UPSs. But one of the challenges that I saw in the morning is when you build a data center, it's never occupied to capacity. Initially, it's very low on loading. So how do you take care of that? Sometimes it is not only in the device that is getting deployed in the solution that needs to be energy efficient, but how you configure your solutions can also make it energy efficient. To give you an example, we have built modular UPS systems where everything is built as blocks, and if the power requirement is not there, we put some of the blocks to sleep, and thereby going up the, you know, the loading curve and getting better efficiency operating points. So these are some simple things that can be done in terms of technology to you, give you that energy efficiency or the robustness in the solution that you're deploying. Learn, taking the learnings from modular UPSs, even today, the large capacity monolithic UPSs are being built in a modular fashion. It not only helps you with energy efficiency, even your downtimes. We talk about mean times to repair. So anything goes wrong in the system, just plug out and plug in. And we talk of hot swappability. All of that is done without asking for a shutdown of your loads. So these are the kind of technologies that we as equipment manufacturers have been doing. Now coming on to the sustainability front, we have also worked with some of the users to build UPSs. We have built a 380 volt DC UPS system. Of course, that does not exist as a standard product. But we work with the customers so that a solar installation on the rooftop could be integrated and a 380-volt DC system is developed, and that power directly goes without any conversion into the servers to uh, be, you know, giving you uh, more energy-efficient data centers. I have a take here. Uh, we as equipment manufacturers cannot bring about all the change and build. So we firmly believe that if we work together with the data center designers, uh, the project managers, we can come out with very robust solutions for future-ready data centers. That's our take on this. Thank you. Thank you. This is quite, uh, you know, in, in detail. Uh, so while you know, I know that we are just sitting between lunch and your, all of you, I just ask one question to all of you. you know, maybe you start with uh, Amit from here, and then we uh, go across. Uh, no conversation is complete without talking about AI in today's time. Uh, what do you think you know, the role of AI in the evolving landscape for data centers, uh, and uh, whether it's in-house, you know, co-located, or a cloud, what you feel is the AI role of AI there? So uh, the way AI is now becoming a buzzword, and we are now seeing a lot of use cases uh, evolving, uh, 
from my perspective, I would look at uh, predictive maintenance as one of the biggest uh, uh, AI indicate uh, AI use cases that uh, that can uh, that would be very uh, you know realistic for me. Uh, uh, as long as you know it, there is this, uh, uh, and the second component is on monitoring of uh, the resources. So for us, all our IT processes are ex uh, very, very resource exhaustive. So anything which gives us any indication that we are reaching the threshold much in advance is what would be really, really you know, uh, the icing on the cake for me. Thank you, Amit. Uh, what are your thoughts, Kior, on the same point? Right. <clears throat> so I would look at AI as a trigger, a very important trigger for most of the workloads that we'll be using today to move to the cloud. Right? Now, why do I say that? Now, as per a, a recent report by Boston Consulting Group in association with NASCOM, the current estimate for AI in India is around 7 billion, USD 7 billion. Now, by 2027, this is going to triple, which says that all of us out here, we are going to consume AI. And are we going to consume AI from our data centers? The answer is no because of obviously the demand supply challenges that we are facing, it is the larger procurers who will be, you know, so, so the concentration of AI infrastructure will be towards data centers and not towards discrete on-prem server rooms, true, true. correct? So all in all, what I'm looking at is AI, you know, making the shift from on-prem to cloud. That is the trigger. I honestly wouldn't give a thought of AI on data centers, but since you have asked the question, I look at AI as another enabler for automation, and I look at the governance of data center to be largely exception driven, which will give me the value as a consumer. You know, so I, I think AI is just another tool which the data centers guys need to use effectively. Thank you, Anand. What do you think? So, so I believe uh, there was a lot that was talked about earlier in the earlier session about you know how the AI can be used in the data center side. So I will give a comment from a customer's perspective. I am a customer, so uh, from a customer's perspective, you know there is a lot that goes uh, to and fro between the service provider and the customer. I believe uh, with the uh, involvement of AI as a tech there, it can be reduced, and uh, we basically can kind of you know cut down on multiple number of you know uh, transactions that are required. Uh, between the customer and the service provider. And of course, uh, that could also uh, empower the business stakeholder directly, rather than the tech team being in control of the assets. Uh, the business uh, stakeholders can now directly interact with the you know, data centers based upon their own requirement and kind of you know, uh, modify the requirements accordingly. Yeah? Thank you. So uh, on the data center, uh, the perspective, I feel the observability across the data center infrastructure will play a key role in, uh, uh, in, in operation, managing operations, because auto healing and uh, the predictive analysis will help to improve the daily operations of the data center. Yeah, so uh, I think uh, we've already, uh, Prashant has already talked about it, but taking cues from what Kevur has said, uh, data center uh, uh, evolution uh, for AI workload is going to be very interesting because uh, they, 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 they'll, it'll require much higher compute than what we are witnessing today. So uh, we are seeing cases where customers are looking at uh, 150 kilowatt per rack or 200 kilowatt per rack kind of cooling. Uh, some of the use cases uh, uh, averaging around 40, 50 kilowatt uh, uh, per rack kind of uh, power requirement. So what it, what it essentially means, uh, data center architecture, which I spoke some time back, has to be extremely flexible. And uh, it should be designed in such a way that the multiple use cases can be supported from the same, same facility while you're still running your traditional load. True. Right? So True. For my thought on your question, I think having in-house data center is going to be more and more challenging uh, to the organizations because nowadays CIO is looked at more, more from the enabling business perspective rather than only from the technology perspective. And what is important in that is how do you, how, how do you play the role of 
frugal modernizer. And having all these cooling systems, different cooling system, different methodology in the data center is going to be very, very uh, ex expensive uh, affair. So I feel uh, going forward, you will see more and more shift towards outsourcing of data centers, uh, which is currently, you know, anyway is happening. And then, as Keur said, hyperscalers are going to play uh, important role because there'll be specific use cases that uh, all of the organizations would be looking at, which can be served by hyperscaler. In addition to that, if they have their own uh, models, uh, own data privacy, if they want to, uh, you know, maintain, they can have their infrastructure co-located in commercial data center. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Yeah, for sure. So taking from where what Jitesh mentioned, uh, you know, we are early adapters to AI as a business practice. And thanks for easing my job saying the CIO is more of a business focused guy because yes. technology is there, but uh, we have to worry about making sure business grows. So, so uh, the compute for AI is definitely going to quadruple, and that's going to probably be a cost context also. Mm -hmm. So from a FinOps concept, context, I believe the hyperscalers of the pure cloud may not able to give you the cost viability at this stage, given that we are still generic. So, so I, I've been studying how AI and computing in AI can be hosted in, in more a pass and a, a IAS kind of a model versus a pure SaaS or a compute model. But for me, the word AI still remains assisted intelligence and not artificial intelligence. I mean, I, I don't see the day. I, it's, it's, again, maybe a hype and a pass through. Mm -hmm. We've gone, and I'm saying this with three years of you know, you can't use AI everywhere, or maybe the CIA's role also can be probably AI'd. I don't know when that will come. And, but it'll be assisting us and not definitely overwriting us, because true, true. that Tom and Jerry thing reminded me of the days of Tom and Jerry. The video was shown earlier, but I don't think the true cat will still remain in the house, right? So that's, that's my take on it. No, that's a good view. Robin? So to me, AI is going to help AI. So if all the challenges are emanating for AI-ready data centers, we will have to use AI probably in the development of more robust infrastructure and the power solutions and the cooling solutions we deploy there. So for that, we need to be very, very careful to select the right kind of devices which are capable of communicating enough information, data, and that data can be then analyzed to take some corrective actions. Yeah, I echo what uh, Robin said. So one is for vendors like us. We have to be AI ready to handle that kind of workloads and uh, capacity. The other thing that I believe uh, is over period, a lot of uh, software will be available as a service, which will be able to talk to some of the data that is getting crunched. And some of these data centers can use it as a service to their clients and monetize uh, these soft, uh, software, which will uh, gradually, instead of a licensing model, it will go into a subscription model with some of these AI offerings. So that's where we are also working towards. Thank you. Thank you, Dev. So thank you, everybody. I think this has been quite insightful to know everybody's perspective. And everybody was very open in sharing their thought processes, their mind. I hope this may help all of you in some way or the other uh, in understanding what people think, like the leaders think uh, from their point of view about all the questions which I asked. So thank you, everybody, again. Thanks for uh, being patient. And uh, sorry for being late uh, on behalf of the team. Uh, thank you once again. Thank you. Let's take one group picture. And uh, I will request Mr. Sandeep Dandekar to join us on the stage to felicitate all our panel members and the moderator. Thank you, Mr. Rahul Sharma, for that interactive session. Yes. Yes, sir. Can we have a huge round of applause, everyone, for all the panel members? <laughs> Mr. Robin Roy, Mr. Anand Tomar, Dr. K. U. Jathil, Mr. Debashish Banerjee, Mr. Pushkar Rege, Mr. Gitesh Mahajan, Mr. Amit Mahajan, Mr. Hemal Patel, and Mr. Songata Basu.
and our moderator, Mr. Rahul Sharma. Thank you, everybody. Please join us for lunch, everyone. We'll resume back after 30 minutes.